So good evening everybody. Just a second. As you can see from the subtitle, I'm going to be talking about what a second is, what can happen in one second, and at the end I'll be taking you through why we need leap seconds. So firstly, a number for you. 35,683,200 seconds. We tend to think of a second as being a relatively short length of time, so how long a length of time is 35 million seconds? Does that ring any bells? Well, I won't wait for a show of hands. That's the length of time it's been since we were first put in lockdown, March 2020. So we've been effectively in a pandemic state, if you like, for 35 million seconds. Whether that sounds like a long time or a short time depends on how you feel about pandemics and your perception of how long you think one second is. So in this talk, I'm going to be describing how time and motion fit together because motion defines time. I'll be looking at the definition of a second, what can happen in one second, and describe how the Earth is slowing down and why the Earth is slowing down and think about the consequences. If the Earth is slowing down, does that mean a second is getting longer? And finally, why do we need leap seconds? So firstly, just let's think about time. The way we think about time is always with respect to motion. In other words, we measure the passage of time by looking at something moving. So for millennia, of course, the passage of time has been measured by looking at astronomical objects such as the sun passing across the sky, casting shadows on a sundial, or perhaps the phases of the moon if we want a slightly longer time scale. But if we ask what is a second, you might say, well, surely that's trivial. We know exactly what a second is. The, the Earth spins once a day and a day is divided into 24 hours, and an hour is divided into 60 minutes, and a minute is divided into 60 seconds. So, of course, one second is just that fraction of a day, 1 over 24 times 60 times 60. And that, when we multiply it all out, comes out to be 86,400. That number, perhaps not surprisingly, will crop up more than once in the next half hour or so. So if a second is just that fraction of a day, then Simples. Um, that presumably is the end of the talk. Oh, OK, not quite, because we do have to do a little bit of thinking to figure out why a second is not quite what we think it is. As the Earth goes round the Sun, the Earth's orbit is an ellipse, and the Earth's speed varies as we go around the Sun. So even if the Earth is turning on its axis once a day, in terms of where is the Sun in the sky, we have to bear in mind that the Sun doesn't always appear to be in the same place in the sky at the same time of day, simply because in some cases we're moving quite quickly and in others we're moving quite slowly. In this particular diagram, the blue areas, the area swept out by the Earth's motion during one month, is quite different when it's at its furthest from the Sun and when it's at its closest to the Sun. The blue areas are the same, but you can see the speed that the Earth needs to move in order to sweep out equal areas in equal time means that those velocities can be quite different. OK, this diagram has been exaggerated somewhat. The ellipticity of the Earth isn't quite as eccentric as I would indicate there. But the fact that the Earth's orbit is an ellipse, that's why if you create an analemma, if you photograph the Sun at the same time of day throughout the year, for instance if you were to photograph it at 12 o'clock according to your watch, you would produce an image like this if you take an image uh, every, what is this, every week or so throughout the year, you get this classic analemma. There's a north-south variation because of the tilt of the Earth. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, the Sun is higher in the sky in June and lower in the sky in December. But you notice that as well as having a considerable north-south variation, there's also a variation from east to west, even if we take the picture at the same time of day. For instance, if we take the picture at 12 o'clock, sometimes the Sun hasn't quite reached the meridian yet, and sometimes the Sun has already passed the meridian. And that's because of what we've just seen about the elliptical orbit around the Sun that produces the east-west variation. And the combination of those two produce this figure of eight that we would see if we have the patience of trying to photograph the analemma. 
So the analemma tells us that sundials aren't accurate. The sun is not always in the same place in the sky, it depends on the time of year. So the shadows cast on the clock face can't be relied on to tell us what is the spin of the Earth because the Earth's orbit makes the Sun appear to be in the different parts of the sky. So we can't tell how the Earth spins on its axis by looking at a sundial. If we wanted to measure the length of a day, then we need something, we need a clock, much more accurate than a sundial. And in this talk, when I talk about the length of the day, I'm not talking about the length of daylight, I'm not talking about the interval between sunrise and sunset, I'm talking about how long does it take the Earth to rotate once on its axis. So let's think about what a second actually is. Since 1968, the second has had a very precise definition. A certain number, I won't read it up, out, it's had about 9 billion oscillations of a cesium atom is defined to be a second. Strictly speaking, it's not the atom, it's the microwave radiation that corresponds to a transition between two energy levels in a particular isotope of cesium. But we don't have to worry about those details. Cesium is an atom that basically produces energy level changes and hence produces microwaves of a very specific frequency. And if we measure that frequency and simply count 9 billion variations of that um, microwave radiation, then that's what we've defined as one second. That is called the cesium standard. And in the picture there, you'll see an indication what, a, what an atomic clock used to look like in the very early days. And using cesium radiation, it's a very stable way of measuring the passage of time, and we can get the precision down to something of order one nanosecond, one billionth of a second per day. And because that variation doesn't necessarily add up day by day, it's equivalent to something like one second over a period of something like 30 million years. NASA are developing uh, new types of uh, atomic clock. They are trying to uh, make it a little more compact, and you can see here in the picture, um, NASA are developing a so-called deep space atomic clock. It's not the whole thing we're looking at there, it's just this little box on the top. This little box about the size of a toaster is an atomic clock which is being tested in space probes. Basically, if you send a probe out into the solar system, if the probe has a very accurate internal timekeeping and it doesn't rely on signals from Earth, then if the probe knows how much it's accelerating, which it can do from inbuilt accelerometers, a bit like the accelerometers that you would have in your mobile phone, then if a space probe knows how much it is accelerating and it knows precisely how long it's been doing that, then it can work out where it is. So navigation relies on accurate timekeeping as well. And indeed, back on Earth, we need accurate timekeeping. For instance, if we take one example, the GPS system, you're sitting at a particular point on the Earth and you're picking up signals from various GPS satellites. Well, basically, the receiver that you have, either in your GPS or in your phone, it's basically working out the time differences between when signals were sent and when the signal arrived on Earth. And knowing the speed of light, if you know the time interval, then you can work out the distance between the satellite and where you are. And if you know where the satellites are, that means you can work out where you are. So each GPS system has an atomic clock on board because timing is crucial. And if the timing was wrong, for instance, if one of the atomic clocks on board a satellite was wrong by a millisecond, then the distance you calculate would be wrong by 300 kilometers, because that's how far light travels in one thousandth of a second. You would probably be placed in the wrong continent, let alone in the wrong town. If the clock is wrong by one microsecond, one millionth of a second, then the distance would be wrong by 300 meters. It would put you in the right country, it would probably put you in the right time, uh, the, right, the right town, but it wouldn't necessarily put you on the right side of the road or tell you when your next exit was due. So we can see that we do need accuracy of GPS clocks that are good to billionths of a second if we want to get the sort of accuracy we expect from a GPS system to tell us where we are on Earth to an accuracy of a few meters. Accuracy does matter. GPS clocks can't be allowed to drift too far 
The individual atomic clocks in each of the satellites will drift very slowly relative to each other, and so they are resynchronized effectively as often as possible. They could be allowed to drift for a few days, maybe even up to a week or two, and the system would cope with that. But just to be on the safe side, all the clocks are resynchronized to a ground station every few hours to keep the system ticking over nicely. So what can happen in one second? Well, if you think about computers, for instance, the fastest supercomputer around can do that many calculations in a second. 200,000 million million calculations per second, which is a stunningly fast number. Even the machine sitting in front of you, whether it be a tablet or a laptop or a desktop computer, that can probably do a billion calculations a second. So the amount that can happen in one second is truly, uh, truly stupendous. Even if we had a supercomputer that's capable of 200,000 million million calculations a second, bear in mind that if we want to do a complex simulation, for instance, a simulation of how the early universe evolves and how galaxies form, that could take days or weeks or months of number crunching, even doing that many calculations per second. That's just a sobering reminder that the sort of simulations that sometimes you take for granted need an enormous number of calculations to actually complete. We can also think on a slightly more mundane scale about uh, what can happen in one second. We know light, of course, travels a great distance in one second. Light travels, well, it used to be in old money, 186,000 miles in one second. These days we tend to quote it as 300,000 kilometers in one second. And of course, man-made objects only travel at a very pedestrian rate compared to that. Two of the fastest man-made probes, which are currently hurtling out of the solar system, they're only travelling at a rather mundane 16 kilometres a second, a very low speed, of course, compared to the speed of light. But if we think on, again, a more slightly day-to-day -day, um, level, if we think about some statistics which I culled in the pre-pandemic era, I don't know if these have been updated for the last few months, but if we take a typical second out of 2019, we found that 300,000 text messages were sent every second of 2019. And 60,000 searches were carried out by Google and other search engines are available. In one second of 2019, 75,000 videos are streamed each and every second. Oh, sorry, were streamed each and every second. I believe that of those 75,000 videos, most of them probably contained a cat or a kitten, but I don't know the statistics for that. 700,000 messages via WhatsApp or other apps like that were sent backwards and forwards across the internet each and every second of 2019. And an absolutely staggering 3 million emails were sent. OK, a few of those would have been spam, but still, 3 million emails each and every second just reminds us how much traffic is flowing backwards and forwards across the internet. So an awful lot can happen in one second. So let's get back to the Earth. The Earth is slowing down. Atomic clocks tell us that the Earth is slowing down. Back in 1968, when atomic time was instigated, the Earth made one turn in 24 hours. That's not strictly correct. When 1968 atomic time was introduced, they standardised and said, let's define a second such that the Earth turns in 86,400 seconds. In other words, at a point in the past, the day was exactly 24 hours. But we've had atomic time now for more than 50 years, and at the moment, the Earth is turning at a rate of not one revolution a day. At the moment, one day is uh, 86,400.001 seconds. The length of the day is now longer than 24 hours, and approximately speaking, it's about one millisecond longer at the moment. Why should that be? Well, if we think back to the formation of the Earth, we believe that something aboard a four and a half billion years ago, a Mars-sized object collided with the Earth. We're calling that object Theia. 
We don't know how fast the Earth was rotating up to that point, because as soon as this collision took place, all bets are off. A huge amount of material was spooled off the collision, and most of the, that material eventually condensed into what we now call the Moon. And what was left was a very rapidly spinning Earth. The Earth took a little while to recover from the shock of being impacted by Theia, but as soon as it recovered from the shock, its rotation period was something of order five hours. So the day was very short, shortly after the Theia impact. And ever since then, the rotation period has been getting longer and longer. It's currently 24-ish hours. It's obviously slowed down a lot from its early days of about a five-hour rotation period, some four and a half billion years ago. So why is it slowing down? Well, it's slowing down for the very reason that we had the material spooled off in the first place. That produced the moon, which is producing its own gravity. Only 1% of the Earth's mass, but still it has an effect. The moon raises tides on the Earth, and you can see here representation. None of this is to scale. It, there's a representation here of the tidal bulge because of the tides raised by the moon. And you can see that the tides are not lined up in a in a line with the Moon, because the Earth is rotating relatively rapidly. The Earth is rotating once a day, and of course the Moon is going round the Earth at about once a month. So the Earth's rotation is pulling the tidal bulge a little bit ahead of the line joining the Earth to the Moon. And the Moon is tugging on that tidal bulge, and it's effectively applying the brakes, and it is slowing the Earth down. You could say that the Moon is robbing some of the angular momentum of the Earth and it's being transferred to the angular momentum of the Moon, which is now slowly moving away from the Earth. That has been going on for the last four and a half billion years and will continue for quite some time to come, but eventually it'll get to the point where the Moon continues to slow down the Earth and eventually there will come a time when the Earth's rotation and the Moon going around the Earth will have the same value. They will be tidally locked. In other words, the length of a day and the length of a month will be the same thing. The Earth will take a certain length of time to rotate and in that same time the Moon will, will do one rotation of the Earth. So we know at the moment the Moon always has one particular face facing the Earth. Eventually it'll be the same the other way round. Eventually one face of the Earth will always face the Moon and they will be tidally locked so they will always face each other and neither will rotate relative to the other. So it means that some lucky people on half of the Earth will see the Moon in the sky and the unlucky people on the other side of the Earth will never see the Moon in the sky. It'll take some time for that to happen, but in the meantime the Moon is still slowing the Earth down. So what? So the Moon is slowing the Earth. Well, a day is not an exact number of seconds, because it used to be exactly 86,400 and now it's 86,400 and a bit. So what? It's not an exact number. Well, it's a little like the problem we have with the year not being an exact number of days. We've known about that, of course, for a long time, and we know that one year is 365 and a bit days. The fraction there is 0.2422. We know it a little more accurately than that. So, of course, if not addressed, and we simply said a year is 365 days, then the calendar would drift very slowly relative to the seasons. Instead of having for the Northern Hemisphere midwinter in December, it would slowly change if the year and the, uh, the calendar year and the seasons got slowly out of sync with each other. We can keep them close to being in sync if we add an extra day every fourth year to the calendar, because that would give us a year of 365.25 days, which of course is a reasonably good approximation to the actual length of a year. So, we can keep the calendar reasonably in sync with seasons if we add a leap day every four years. It's not quite right though. 365.25 isn't good enough. So, there's a rule that says we'll skip a leap day in a century that's not divisible by 400. Why that rule? Because if we obey that particular rule for adding leap days, then the length of the calendar year 
check it for yourself offline, becomes 365.2425 days. And that is very close to the true length of a year, 365.2422 something. That's pretty damn close. And it's close enough that if we have this rule for when we include leap days, that keeps the calendar in sync with the seasons, not just for the next few years, it keeps them in sync for thousands and thousands of years into the future. In other words, we are fairly happy that as long as we do this, our calendar is safe and will be synchronized with the seasons. So we have a certain ability to say this is what's going to happen. As long as we do this, we have no problem. But it's different for seconds. If we want our 24-hour clock to stay synchronized with the rotation of the Earth, in other words, if we want the sun to be in the sky when our clocks say it's daytime, we don't particularly want to say, well, it's noon, but it appears that the sun has already gone down. If we want the clocks to say, stay synchronized with the Earth, just like we want the calendar to stay synchronized with the seasons, then we need to do something about it. And one option is to say, right, just like adding leap days gets rid of the problem with the calendar, all we need to do is to add leap seconds because a day isn't quite a whole number of seconds. We just need to add leap seconds once in a while. Well, strictly, we don't need to. We could say, let's not bother with leap seconds. If the Earth is slowing down, well, all we need to do is slow down our clocks, and then our clocks will always say that the Earth takes 86,400 seconds. In other words, a day will always be 24 hours if we simply slow down our clocks as the Earth is slowing down. However, perhaps you can see the problem with that. The scientists would be furious because it would mean you have to keep redefining what a second actually is. You would have to continuously tweak your atomic clocks to make them run slow to match the rotation period of the Earth. In other words, the definition of a second would change every few hours, every few days, whatever. And that is no way of doing science if you have to keep redefining one of the fundamental units that you use. So arguably that is not really a solution. So we're back to if we want to keep synchronization, we need leap seconds. If you want to keep the scientists happy, you can't avoid leap seconds if you want to stay synchronized. You either let things drift or you introduce leap seconds. Let's have a look at how long the day actually is. This is a graph of how long the day has been measured for various years from 1960 to I think last year, 2019. And the vertical scale here is the length of the day after you've taken 86,400 seconds off. So it's the extra bit and it's measured in milliseconds. You can see there, one, two, three, four milliseconds. So it was uh, zero back in the 1960s, and then it's gone up, and the day has got longer, uh, and then it's come down again, then it's gone up again, then it's gone down again. But notice that there's a continuous variation. This is not just noise, this hair that seems to be here on this, uh, on this plot of the length of a day. If you look at it closely, perhaps you notice that these lines are going up and down and up and down, on a year-by-year -year basis. They are not random. The size of the variation looks a little bit noisy, but the frequency with that, which that variation crops up is always goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, year by year by year by year. So, so there's something about the way the Earth goes around the Sun that is determining a variation in the length of the day. And it was understood quite some time ago that that variation is due to the atmosphere of the Earth. We're measuring the rotation of the solid Earth, but the angular momentum of the whole thing, the solid Earth and the air that's circulating with it, if the air changes, then the rotation of the globe changes because they are fixed by a law called the conservation of angular momentum. So if one speeds up, the other has to slow down. 
So why should the atmosphere change? Well, because of the seasons. Remember, the amount of sunlight you get in the northern or southern hemisphere will depend on whether you're talking about northern summer or northern winter. That will vary through the seasons. And hence the rotation and the circulation of the Earth's atmosphere changes. Winds travel in different directions depending on the seasons, because it's all dominated by how heat is dumped into the Earth's atmosphere by the sun. So if the Earth's atmosphere circulation changes on a yearly basis, then so the variation in the period of rotation of the Earth changes on a yearly basis as well. So that explains the sort of fuzz in that background curve. But the elephant in the room is, well, why is it varying by quite a few milliseconds on a period of decades? You might say, is it something to do with the way the Earth is changing? Is it earthquakes or rearrangement of the crust? Well, that can produce some small variations, but it doesn't explain this large variation over many decades. If it's not the core of the Earth, which we don't think it is, if it's not the crust of the Earth, if it's not the atmosphere, perhaps the Earth's mantle is changing in some way that we perhaps don't fully understand that's giving rise to these variations. So on average, there's an increase in the length of the day over billions of years. But over decades, there seems to be variations that we need to get a handle on to better understand what's going on. But the important thing is, we can't easily predict what's coming next. Remember, with adjusting the calendar, we, need, we know exactly what needs to be done, inserting a leap day, in order to keep the calendar fixed. But with leap seconds, we need to know how long the day is, but the day keeps changing and it's rather difficult to predict what the day length is going to be in 2025 or 2030. So how do we know until we get there whether or not we need a leap second or not? And that's part of the problem. Leap days are nice and well defined. We all agree that we will put the uh, extra leap day as a 29th of February, we will do that every four years, with the exception of century years, etc. And then jobs are good and we know exactly what's going on. But with leap seconds, we can't predict the future. We can only tell by looking at what the Earth has been doing in terms of its rotation period. It's only then that we can work out whether or not we need to add a leap second. So that has to be decided by the International Earth Rotation Service. I just wonder who works for these guys and what happens if they take a day off? Does the Earth stop turning? Maybe not. But they decide how often a leap second should be added. They look at the rotation of the Earth, they look at the last few years, and they decide whether or not the clocks need to be resynchronized by adding a leap second. And they decide when it should be inserted. If we look at this and ignore the big fuzzy um, curve in the middle, the large one, and think more about this fainter grey line, we see that that corresponds to the scale on the right hand side in red here. These are leap seconds that have been inserted into the system since 1972. That's when it was first decided that we ought to really think about synchronising clocks, and as of 1972, leap seconds have been added every once in a while to try and keep things in sync. Notice that when the length of the day was some three milliseconds longer than 24 hours, quite a lot of, millis uh, quite a lot of leap seconds were introduced for quite a few years. In one year it looks like two leap seconds were introduced in the same year. But you notice that for whatever reason, in the early noughties, between 2000 and 2005 down here, the Earth's rotation, for whatever reason, seemed to speed up to the point where its rotation period was very close to 24 hours. And hence, you notice there were no leap seconds introduced for about five or six years here, because the Earth's rotation was so close to 24 hours, leap seconds weren't needed. But then the Earth started slowing again, and the curve started increasing, and more leap seconds have been added. The last leap second, I think, was 2018, if I remember correctly. We haven't had one for the last couple of years. If you think about how leap seconds manifest themselves, well, if you think about around about midnight, a clock would normally change from 59.59, if we watch that tick over, it changes to zero, 00 for the start of the next day. 
But if we wanted to introduce a leap second, the conventional way of doing it is to have 59.59 followed by 59.60, and then it goes to zero. In other words, 23.59.60 is actually a perfectly valid time in a year which has a leap second added. However, if you try and input a time of 23.59.60 into some computers, either they refuse to take that time, even if they know a leap second has been added, or some computer systems will actually crash if you try and put that time in. And should you necessarily put it in at midnight? And if you do put it in at midnight, well, who's midnight? Um, because midnight in Japan is going to occur earlier than midnight in China or India or midnight in Europe or midnight in the USA. And if you don't insert a leap second in every clock simultaneously at the same instant, not simply at midnight, which scans its way across the time zones, if you don't do that, that means international clocks will be out of sync with each other by anything up to one second. Who cares about one second? Well, think about global finance. What if one bank somewhere in the world wants to send a billion dollars to another bank and they agree that that transaction will take place at this particular time, at two o'clock, this particular time zone, or whatever? But if their clocks don't agree by half a second, then it might leave one country and it will only appear in the other country half a second later. What happens during that half second? Who owns the money during the half second after this bank has sent it and this bank receives it? Does it belong to anybody? What if a cyber thief decides to take the money? Who has he stolen it from? Synchronization of time absolutely matters when computers are capable of doing billions of calculations a second and in principle billions of transactions could take place every second. One second suddenly becomes a very long time. Some people really don't like leap seconds. The fact that you don't know when they're coming. Every computer, in principle, knows when the leap seconds have been, so that if you want to think about a previous date, your computer should understand if a leap second has been introduced last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago if you're trying to look back at historical records. But some computer systems don't handle leap seconds particularly well, partly because they can't be predicted. You have to simply know this year was a leap second introduced, and in that year a leap second wasn't introduced. You simply have to keep records. Not only do some computer systems don't like leap seconds, some companies don't like leap seconds. They don't like this idea of a minute having 61 seconds. If somebody asks you how many seconds in a minute, the answer isn't 60. The answer is usually 60, but occasionally 61. And some companies really don't like that. For instance, Google decided not to introduce a leap second when everybody else would do so at a particular time of day. They decided to smear the leap second to avoid having 61 seconds in the minute. They add the leap second drip feed. They add it a little bit at a time. A few microseconds at a time are added throughout the day rather than waiting for the end of the day or whenever it's been prescribed and then adding one extra second. They do that by running their clocks slow for that particular day. If a, if a leap second has been deemed to be added on that particular day, rather than wait and add it, they run their clocks slow for a day. But other companies don't, which means Google's clocks are not synchronized with other people's clocks, even though in principle the clocks are accurate to nanoseconds, Google clocks are different from other people's clocks. Imagine if you tried to do that with a leap day rather than a leap second. Why do the clocks say it's 3 a.m.? Well, adding an extra day at the end of February creates too many glitches. Instead, we're running our clocks 3% slow during February to avoid the irregularity. If you run your clocks 3% slow, you don't have to add the 29th of February at the end of the month. So that's a joke that Google has expanded its idea of leap second smearing and applied it to leap days as well. Leap day smearing is just a joke. But the problem of leap seconds and what to do about them 
is really serious, especially in these days of high-speed computers and high-speed transactions across the internet. The International Telecommunication start again. The International Telecommunication Union, which is a UN agency, was given the job of deciding what do we do about this problem? Do we go on not knowing when the next leap second is coming? Do we put leap seconds in as we need them? Do we abolish leap seconds and let the clocks drift? Or do we anger the scientists by redefining a second continuously to allow for the slowing of the rotation of the Earth? They had to make a decision. And in 2015, they decided a momentous decision. They decided in 2015 not to decide anything until 2023. They've simply put off the problem until later. So now we're only a couple of years away from the point at which somebody, somewhere, is going to have to decide what we do about leap seconds. Do we keep them or do we ditch them? So I've been telling you about what a second is, what can happen in one second. I've been telling you about the Earth slowing down because of the gravitational pull of the Moon. Are seconds getting longer? Well, no, atomic time is keeping seconds the same, and hence we need leap seconds if we want to keep our clocks synchronised with the rotation of the Earth. And we don't know what's going to happen beyond 2023. Watch this space. Thank you for listening for the last 2,000 seconds.